In this episode, could it be any more breathtaking? We cover 187 scale vehicle upgrade, as well as the SDL 39 continues to get an overview by looking at the details. That's just a little tiny etched piece of metal in the Milwaukee Road logo. We also take a look at that auto rack by how it's clamped up, right down to the weathering techniques that I end up using. We also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Sue the Milwaukee Road. All right, today we're taking a look at a 1965 Chevrolet Stepside pickup. A little before and after. The one on the left has uh, not had any modifications. The one on the right has. Uh, a few things that we can note as far as the upgrades are concerned uh, to begin with is the wheel placement. If you notice, the wheels are turned on this one. Uh, the vehicle shows to be turning left here. But if I want it to be turning right, I can just roll it forward and the wheels are turned to the right. I don't want to leave it in that position because the thing looks like, a, you know, it's got a broken axle. But uh, we've set it up in such a way that it makes the vehicle look like it's turning. So we make this couple look like they're pulling into a driveway. <coughs> and you might have noticed that there are people inside. I got a driver as well as a passenger. Uh, I did upgrade the steering wheel in there. It's got an etched steering wheel uh, by John Tyson. Uh, he's on Facebook. He puts out a lot of 187 scale vehicle stuff. I picked up steering wheels and rear view mirrors uh, as well as side view mirrors that uh, he provides in a stamped uh, cutout piece of stainless. So I've got that. I went with a little bit of a wonky front license plate. Uh, I did replace the big wide one that the manufacturer had. I went with a little bit more of a, you know, a traditional stainless steel as well. Uh, the headlights have been upgraded to MV products, which uh, they used to make class lights for locomotives, but uh, I'm using it for headlights on a vehicle like this. This was the, the traditional as delivered. I didn't really think that represented a very good headlight. I like that style a little bit better. I did chrome the bumpers. I used the chrome pen to be able to kind of snap it up with a slight satin finish over the top, which knocks down uh, the shininess of the chrome so it matched the grill a little bit better. Uh, so that's the update on the front end of the vehicle. A very small detail to notice is actually at the bottom of the A-pillar, there is a blue bit of paint added there. There's a little bit of a discoloration in the camera. It's a lot closer, I think, in person, but you can see that there is a little bit of a Rock Island blue added at the bottom. If you look at the, the manufacturer, this is actually clear plastic. That's a glazing. Uh, fellow modeler Curtis noted this little uh, detail that now I've been addressing on these Chevrolet trucks. So this one would get painted white, that little uh, wedge right there. Uh, the bed of the truck, if you can see inside the bed of the truck here, uh, it's been painted uh, brown with silver slats. Uh, manufacturer just delivers it just all white. So I think it's kind of nice to add that little bit of a detail in the back. Uh, very tough to see, but there is an antenna here. What? This antenna is from Engineering. They make a very, very small stainless steel wire that I drill out a hole and I apply an antenna. So you got to be careful when you're looking at a vehicle. Let's see if we just bump just a little bit to straighten it out. There we go. Kind of got knocked when I set it in place. But to look at the rear of the vehicle, I did upgrade the bumper as well. So this rear bumper, uh, I ended up chroming it. I got rid of these little red uh, tail lights that were in the bottom of the bumper. I like just the clean silver look. I put a Minnesota license plate in there. Uh, it is kind of tucked up in, in that little recess, tough to see at this angle, but there is a license plate in there. Uh, and then the last thing that I do is on the very back edge across the top of this cab, you'll notice that you can kind of see a line across there. Well, that's the actual clear window line. You paint it white to get rid of that because that would match the cab. Um, obviously it's not intended to look like this, but that's the way it came from the manufacturers and most of them have this kind of a look. So very simple little details to add to a vehicle like this, to be able to snap them up on your railroad. This particular one, uh, the blue one is going to Tom Tennyson. He's a fellow modeler that participated in one of our layout tour conversations in the spring of 2020. And I said I'd send out a vehicle, uh, but this is his vehicle, that blue one is going to him. I don't do this very often, uh, but I know modelers that are out there that enjoy it. Seeing some of the details that go into it, it's a very simple process. I didn't want to dive into all the nitty gritty. The nitty gritty. The nitty gritty. The nitty gritty. The nitty gritty on this particular one. Uh, but I wanted to give you guys a look at what you can do to a truck to be able to make it look better on your railroad. The mark stenciled on the sides of equipment such as locomotives, freight cars, and passenger cars is a reporting mark. These fleet car number is assigned by the owner. These reporting marks, code and number, used by the railroads, rail car owners, shippers to identify and track the equipment. Which reporting mark was not commonly used? Was it A, Sue, 
B, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Sault Ste. Marie, C, Sioux Line, or D, MSTP and SSM? We'll find out later in this episode. Uh, aren't B and D the same? The herald that's on the side, that is actually a etched piece of metal. So you can see these ones here, it's a Milwaukee Road logo. It's a little piece of etched metal. Uh, they are extremely expensive for the size. I don't think it's necessary to maybe go that to that length. Um, but if you do want to create a separate uh, herald, I do have a, a version on number 583. Somebody had just applied it and they lightly sanded the surface um, to be able to expose the lettering. What I did is I used Circus City decals and I laid one of their heralds over that metal etched, um, that's just a little tiny etched piece of metal, the Milwaukee Road logo. So now that I've got the decal applied itself, um, let's look at the paint. Um, the paint itself was done by Joe Binish. Hello. Fellow modeler, he painted the orange and the black. Um, he was kind enough, they're both scale coat two. I mixed just a, a little bit of yellow into the orange for him. So my, my Milwaukee Road orange has a little bit of yellow to it. Uh, and then the black itself is just the straight scale coat two black. Uh, I wanted to make sure that there was a nice paint scheme laid down on this. He did lay down uh, Tamiya white primer first. Uh, which gave it a nice base and then he laid the black or laid the orange down and then laid the black down uh, i decaled it uh, i did do the custom artwork to create the 589 and the number boards uh, and everything on it except for the billboard milwaukee road and the milwaukee road and the long hood uh, those were done by circus city decals i had him print up a set uh, as well as bill berlinger uh, who also does decals i've been printing with him for a long time uh, i sent out a set to him and i sent out a set um, to Circus City just to kind of compare the two. Um, they are neck and neck. Uh, I think they're both uh, quality decal producers, but uh, Bill really dials into the details to make sure that the trapping is right. Um, there's some very fine little refinements that uh, I think he keys in on and he's always messaged me in the past about doing some of that extra um, refinement to make sure that you get the sharpest possible decal uh, out there. Uh, Circus City, like I said, is right up there with them. So if you're looking for de decal producers or guys that are carrying decals, um, Bill or Circus City are both worth uh, reaching out to. Uh, and the last thing I want to cover on this particular unit is the interior. So the interior, I did put a crew in there. As you can see, there's a guy wearing a Sioux line jacket. I uh, got an engineer, but he also might have noticed that the, uh, the lights stayed on because this particular unit, I did put a Keep Alive in there. Uh, it's a TCS Keep Alive that you can see that the locomotive retains power even though it's not on the track. Uh, that just helps you get through uh, points or, or dirty spots in your track without the sound and lights flickering and cutting out. Is it necessary? Uh, I don't think so. I think you should actually address the problem with your track first. Anytime you've got dirty track or something of that nature, um, areas you can't reach on your railroad, these things will just help you get through there uh, until you can maintain that, that, that issue. All right, we take a trip out to the GN 1970 real quick just to take a look at some of these details. Pay attention to the decals as well as the crew in the interior. It's a short clip. So watch quickly. All right, did you guess which reporting mark was not commonly used and said D, M, S, T, P, and S, S, M? That sounds like quite the multiple letters. Well, you note that the reporting marks on the side of the car actually are spelt out and M, S, T, P, and S, S, M wasn't used. But if you look at the end of the car, it actually still says Sioux Line. That's what the car was marked under, as well as W, C. So technically B and D are acceptable answers. D was the correct answer, but B, we'll give you a half a point. Oh boy, that was confusing. I don't know, I didn't quite get that. That makes sense to you? Yeah, it didn't make any sense to me. Well, I tell you right now, these quiz questions, I wonder who's keeping score. Well, I got a half a point. All right, we continue moving forward with the AccuRail Great Northern Auto Rack. What I'm doing here is just cleaning up those glue slops. And the way I went about doing it is using an X-Acto blade and just lightly scuffing off those glue slops. Fairly straightforward, but when it really comes down to it, it's kind of a tedious little process. We've obviously sped things up to be able to, uh, well, save you some time. This is kind of the end product. I got a little bit more touching up to do, but you get the idea. Now we flip this thing over and take a look at gluing the underside of the car together. There are three posts. You can snap these kind of in place, but the best thing to do is actually clamp them. The post is here, here, and here. I end up dropping a little bit of uh, 10X or glue down in here to be able to hold this in place. 
Let the clamp sit for a while because, well, it takes a little while for the glue to dry, but you want to make sure that it cures thoroughly. Another thing I did is I took these X's out. The prototype didn't have these support braces, but all Accurail cars have them. So I ended up taking these out and, well, making it look a little bit more prototypical. All right, as you can see, the clamps are in place, the support braces are gone, and we're gonna let this thing set, and then we're gonna eventually dive into weathering it. All right, it's time to start into the weathering, and I use Doc O'Brien's weathering powders, the best investment I've ever made. It's totally changed my weathering technique. Uh, these are the chalks I commonly use. Mostly a lot of earth tones. But we always start out with this highlight white, and that is doing just what it says, highlighting. You're trying to highlight the details. I end up just lightly brushing this over the top of the car, generally from the top down. Can you bring it back in frame, please? I can't see the car. All right, what we've got here is just bringing out the detail. I'm going over the entire car. I do this, I'm only going to do it on the end so you can kind of see a little before and after uh, to get an idea of what we're talking about. The recesses and details show up when you use the white highlight. As you can see here on the left, not much detail. On the right, lots of detail. It's not that detail. So I'm going to go about this process and just cover the entire car in white. Now one thing to remember when using white chalks, it looks a lot more aggressive when you're applying it, but it's actually going to get knocked down when you use the dull coat or a flat finish over the entire car. So you can be a little aggressive. Not too aggressive. You don't want it to look like snow. But you want to put it on there enough that you're going to make sure that you're bringing out the highlights as well as kind of fading the paint. We're going to save a little time here and slip over to Grungy Gray. Now the Grungy Gray is just adding a little bit of grit. I know the Great Northern Herald that's on this car, in my era, it's going to be about 20 some years old. So I'm going to start knocking it down. I'm applying the Grungy Gray. I'll probably add a little bit of the rust. I'll add a little bit of the grimy black. But our whole goal here is to knock things down. So we're going to slide over to the Rusty Brown. Same type of thing. We've laid the white down. You're going to lay a little bit of this rust over the top of it. And that's just going to kind of pick up some of the highlights. And uh, you say, well, why do you lay the white and then lay that rust over it? I always do this because you're highlighting to emphasize the details. And then adding a little bit of the rust ends up kind of blending the whole thing kind of together. So it's a layering technique. It doesn't make sense for some people. They always think you're just covering it all up. If you look at the masters in the past, the great artists of the Da Vinci's and Rembrandt's, they layered their paint. You're doing the same thing, and now you can call yourself a Da Vinci or a Rembrandt. I don't think that's how it works. After you've laid down your chocks, it's time to lay down a clear coat. I use a tester's dull coat, and, well, here's the end product. As you can see, it wasn't any earth-shattering, groundbreaking secret. It was a pretty simple process. You just got to step out there and do it. Knock down those bright-looking cars and make them look a little bit more natural. All right, here's a curmudgeon coming at you for the crap of the week. The crap of the week this week is about manufacturers not making what I want. I ask for an SDL39, and then sure, they come out with it, and then I complain that, ooh, it's not quite right, I don't like the beacon. And the next thing you know, they're going to produce it, and they're going to say, we're going to work on it, we're going to try to make it better, and then it comes out, and they say, ooh, I don't really like this, I don't like that, I'm just bellyaching just to bellyache, because that's <laughs> what the curmudgeon does. It doesn't matter what the manufacturers are going to create, I'm going to have something to complain about, and that's the curmudgeon's crap of the week. I'm just bellyaching just to bellyache, because that's <laughs> what the curmudgeon does. <laughs> A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN1970. 70s. I'm just bellyaching just to bellyache, because that's <laughs> what the curmudgeon does. Ah, nice.